Okay, I think it's um, uh, time to begin. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, uh, my name is Tony Payan. I'm the director of the Mexico Center. Uh, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to the Baker Institute for Public Policy here at Rice University. As you know, uh, Mexico elected a new leader on July 1st, 2018. Uh, Mr. Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador is now the country's president through the end of 2024. Mr. Lopez Obrador uh, take, uh, takes office having promised to take the country in a very different direction than it has been on for the last 30 years. He also inherits enormous challenges, including raising economic growth from 2 to 4%, he promised, lowering levels of poverty and inequality, tackling the issue of Central American migration through Mexico, stabilizing the relationship with the United States, and very importantly, reinforcing the rule of law in Mexico. Of all these formidable challenges, the last is perhaps the most complex of all. The rule of law means all crimes past and present must be dealt with, fighting corruption, providing public safety and security will also be at the center of the agenda. But none of this will be easy. 2018 is already slated to be the most violent year on record. Over 30,000 homicides and the administration of justice institutions are simply buckling under their own incompetence. Although President Lopez Obrador has already taken the first few steps towards addressing the issue of the rule of law and specifically the problem of public safety and security, there are very serious doubts about whether his proposal is truly anything that has not already been tried and whether he can guarantee that his efforts will not end up in failure. Violence and crime have to a large extent determined the way the previous administrations will, re will be remembered in history and they are likely to be a maker or breaker for this administration as well. Hardly anyone has more extensive and deeper knowledge of the kind of challenge that providing public safety and security represents to the new Mexican administration as does our guest today. Mr. Garcia Luna has been to the Baker Institute before and we have called upon him again to remind us of the opportunities and constraints around this important challenge of public safety and security in Mexico. Mr. Garcia Luna is not only a former high-level functionary in the, in the field of public safety and security in Mexico, he is, and I'm convinced of this, a deep thinker and even an academic of these issues in his own right. He will speak a bit about his own thoughts and reflections on what Mexico is required to do to achieve lower levels of violence and greater public safety and security, and how to couple that pursuit with higher levels of prosperity and social well-being for all. And then he and I will come up here and have a conversation on this issue. I have a few questions for him. And after that, we'll open it to a conversation with all of you. Uh, the bio for uh, Mr. Garcia Luna is in your program. You may look at it uh, uh, at, your, at your leisure, but, but I'm convinced that he is probably one of the most important guests that we will have at the Baker Institute on this issue. And so help me welcome our guest to share his own thoughts on this issue, Mr. Genaro Garcia Luna. Okay. Muy buenas noches. Damas y caballeros, eh, primero quiero agradecer a, a Instituto Baker por esta oportunidad, este espacio para poder compartir eh, conocimiento y experiencia con, con ustedes eh, respecto a cuál es la, la perspectiva que hay para México en seguridad y cuál ha sido eh, en los últimos años eh, la evolución respecto a la violencia. 
of our violence and the criminal activity and what is the official focus to address this. So I have a PowerPoint presentation. It's in English. I will speak in Spanish so that I can do uh, a better job for you, but I don't want to make mistakes because this is very delicate and I want to be precise. So if, forbid me. Uh, I'm sorry. If you, I'll apologize ahead of time for you having to listen to me through the translators, but still, thank you. So, my first slide. So, this speaks about the behavior that the country had since 1999 until 2017. This is official data from records from the homicide there is in the country when there is the intent, intentional homicide. So, this is the tendency that we've seen of what the evolution has been over time. And you can see in 2008, there was an increase of this tendency, of these trends, and then how this is important. The, the, from 2017, then there's the next phase of this process. So these are records that are official. Like I said, these the country issues them as official registries for intentional homicide for the country. And I explain this because starting with this and with this perspective, like as Tony, Tony said, the initial question is why violence and why do we get here? How did we get here? And this is a process that we are trying to understand in Mexico. Part of the analysis that we have is in the booklet you have and we analyze the components of this situation. And I will speak about them one by one, describing them. The first one is that there was a change in the criminal behavior in the country with respect to the, the criminal groups. And this, you can see in this pyramid that I have, you can see that on the bottom, the problems we had in the 90s, towards the end of the 90s, we had theft, mugging, mugging of uh, homes and businesses, and this was one or two, maybe three people with activities, with criminal activities that were not even violent. This was just theft, generic theft with low incidence of violence, no arms, no, no guns, but that was the basis. That's how we started. And then in 2008, when we go up to this, this peak that you can see, this top, it goes up. And then we have also theft of cargo and vehicles, then theft of gasoline, and then bank robbery, and then violent crime, like homicide, kidna kidnapping, extortion, and then the criminal organization, which is what we know now in the entire country. So at this point, with this evolution, there's something that's very important to mention, is the use of high-caliber guns. When we have this evolution, this continues to increase the, the um, high-caliber weapons being used. And this is a picture that shows this phenomenon. In 2008, when this evolution started, that I just showed a minute ago, that you can see the increase in violence, Mexico, up to the year 2006, 2007, criminal activities in the, the different criminal groups, we had guns that were revolvers or handguns, not automatic weapons. And so it it wasn't violent, really. And this coincides that in 2004, then we took away this prohibition, and then automatic weapons are being able to be authorized, and then that started to grow in Mexico, and criminal activity increased because people were being able to have access to these automatic weapons. And so then, with operations that the police started against this type, then people were not able to control this. We went from revolvers and handguns 
with low caliber guns to automatic weapons with high high access to, to these weapons, and this was a big problem. So next slide. Let's see. So here you can see as well even other, even higher powered eh, weapons. La la eh, you can see the lo logistics here, you can see the evolution with the criminal behavior as an analysis with respect to violence in this change in patterns. Okay. Oops, sorry. I'm not sure what happened. <laughs> Thank you. So, and here you can see an issue that there's several analyses. We started to see things that we didn't see before in Mexico. These are elements for explosives. These are industrial explosives. And the activity in Mexico was used in mining or industrial activities. And this, we start to find them in criminal activities. When there were weapons or things that had been stolen, and then we started to find this, these elements that are part of the explosives area. This, here in this picture, you can see this is in Ciudad Juarez in 2007. You can see already these bomb cars that, thank God, they didn't detonate, but you can see the amount of explosives in the car. So you just have an idea of what this means. In Europe, in Spain, for example, a bomb car like this, the ones they use there, they only have one of these, just one, to activate the bomb. That's all you need, just one. And see the amount that we had here. So you can see. So if this had detonated, half of the street would have disappeared. That's the magnitude of what this was. Thank God the technical aspect wasn't really there, so they were not ever ready to actually detonate it, but it was ready and it, it could have been done. So this is the evolution that we've had with respect to the violence that this component can cause in this circumstance. Another component that we mentioned is the deterioration of the police forces, specifically the municipal police. And here you can see in 2009, which was at the time, and what we had with respect to the municipal and state police. And you can see at the time, and this same proportion is the same, but this, or to give you an idea, the municipal police had 39% of the territory of the country, and then the state police was 40 5.6, and the federal police was 6. Point, um, 7.8. So this is important. Why? Because from a legal standpoint, who is authorized to do that is the state police for the crime that has an impact on the society and the community, which is theft, homicide. These are local crimes. And that would be the local police that is in charge. That's the 45% that we see here. Now, the point is that the logistical standpoint and the salary that they receive is very bad. These are police that they don't have the operations, the logistics. They don't have that. And with respect to really deal with this crime, they just don't have it. They can't, they can't do it. And you can see this in the corruption there is, the lack of operation capacity that I will show in the next slide as well. So here you can see as well, you can see this graph shows as well. 2009, a survey where you can see how many officers there are in each municipal police department. 
para cada, para cada entidad. For each entity, and you can eh, see that 88.5% is the total of the más, police menos de 100 elementos. that have less than 100 decir, officers. So in the whole country, they have less than 100 officers. So 90% of the country. What does this mean? Well, this means that for the police operations, that means you have three shifts, there's 30 police. But imagine if in your day-to-day -day crime fighting activity, if there was, you know, one one thief that a pickpocket took a, a purse from someone, but today with the level of activity we have, that we have armed commandos, how can they answer? How can they respond? 30 people for the entire community? And that's 90% of the area of the country. Okay. Otra referencia importante, so another muy importante, important difference, que, insisto, very important, es I insist, policía. is the salary they receive, no our, es, our officers. Es, Normally, casi inercial hablar de la corrupción. we have to talk about y corruption by inertia, because this los, is tied los, initially este, to automático. Human beings, it's automatic, and especially in these systems, in how these models were conceived. If you look at this table, you can see how much a municipal police makes. And we can calculate here, we estimate that a minimum salary, the, the, the floor, the basic, it's $500 a month. That's the base salary for a police officer. That's the, the basic, the minimum salary. And that's not even what they had to be able to do their everyday activity. So if you take that into account, so here you see of the $500, this is the deficit that all the police departments have in the salary for all of their employees. So this is how much they make does not pay the actual cost of living that family has for his everyday activity. And this subsidy is paid somehow. It's corruption, it's crime, somebody's paying for it because this is like a little train that is moving and somebody's paying for that gas, either the government or the criminals or corruption, it's paid somehow. So being the Minister of Security, I had to bring this to the attention of the House of Representatives at the Senate to show them what is the deficiency we have in their salaries so that a police officer can have the basic so that he can operate the minimum so that they can fight crime. And I showed them the deficit there was. And they said, well, it's a paradigm. Well, he doesn't have any education, so why should we pay them more? And I said, OK, fine, let's break this formula, this historic formula then. Because we considered that to be a police officer, you maybe didn't have to study and you didn't have to be well educated. I said, OK, let's break this paradigm. Then let's bring people that are educated, that are trained, and pay them the minimum salary so that they are not corrupt and they can't be corrupted so that they can work legally and not be corrupt. That was in 2007. This is still the same. And this is key because corruption is not magic. It is tied with the models. And this has an impact on this scheme. And like I said, this train moves back and forth and somebody's paying for the gas and the state is paying for that gas and the salary. And I insist, the salaries, because there's the, the patrol cars, the operations, the cost, the, all the general costs, all the basics, so there's a lot of costs. Another aspect that is also tied with violence is something very important that it's become even more important. In, at the time, in Mexico, with the history of the country, they abused and used the military police to help 
the police, the regular police officers in the 70s, the 60s, the 80s, even in the 90s. So historically, they actually have have been like a subsidy for the police. And then in 94 until 2000, they tried to reach further and de defeat crime. They talked even to have these special forces from the Air Force, to have these elite as if it was here, you know, uh, like the SEALs or something like that, or Deltas and here to, to fight crime. And they did that, and there were areas where there was more criminal activity, geographically speaking, in the country. And that, those military forces taking action in police areas, in this corrupt area, they became corrupt as well. And then those military, actually the desertion of this military personnel, personnel plus the criminal activity made it even worse. It, it grew exponentially because those those are not weapons that police know how to use, the ones that I just showed you. But yes, the military, yes, they know how to use them. And during that time period, there was a great volume of desertion of the military personnel. And they went to the other side, to the criminal activity groups. And then this made this even worse. So these are many components that have something to do with this violence. And then another thing is a social aspect. Bit, but it's also important, is the growth in uh, the drug use, the drug consumption. And this shows how, you can see here on the screen, the yellow is females, the blue is males, and the other one is total. How this is the age of people starting to use drugs. As you can see, it's going down. And so this is a consumption market. And also, this is tied to the more consumption there is, there's more market for it, and then this adds and makes it worse to the crime violence that we are seeing now. And then as well, we are also saying that even when we try to explain violence, the most important thing in this analysis, aside from what I already said with respect to the weapons and drug consumption and the military desertion and the increase in crime, is the most important even that was abandoned was the attention to the focus of the political actors from the legislative and the executive branches with the community. That was abandoned. So the social management with the community was abandoned. So ma many times in your day to day, the people, in order to pay to get a permit or to rent a commercial space, they had to interact with the criminals, which normally was something that used to be managed by the political actors, whether it is in the legislative branch, the House of Representatives, the senators, the people that were in charge of the social aspect, they were the ones that were in charge. And this vacuum that appeared when they abandoned the community, it was taken up by the criminals, and they gained terrain, and they become social actors of this official activity, and they took control in areas where there was a high crime rate, and that's what happened. And this had a great impact, and it created this process that is becoming even more and more difficult Bien, to continue. So for this exercise, also you can see a comparative analysis to see what are the models in the world that had maybe not the same, but a similar scheme as what happened in Mexico. And then we identified four cities, New York, Chicago, the US, 
in the U.S., and Medellin in Colombia, and Palermo in Italy. These cities had similar situations as what happened in Mexico with a growth in, in, in violence, a growth in criminal activity, and this was, we wanted to compare this, to bring this, and in the book it's, it's explained in, in detail, but just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, just to tell you, you can see here, here, in general terms, in New York, for example, which, of course, you, you have a reference for that and you know they had a very similar problem with the different, different kinds of crime, but more social aspects with theft and that kind of stuff. But we analyzed the impact to the social aspect of it and how did they address it. Here you can, this shows the growth of violence in each city. Red is New York. Below we have years. And see how this grows in New York. Then you can see Chicago, Medellin. In all the three cases, once this um, criminal activity has grown like it has in Mexico, what these cities did, they created government programs in different sectors. In New York, they had the Zero Tolerance Program how to stop these crimes from the baseline, for example, what to do from how to stop even small crimes up to other, then you've got Chicago, we have social programs, educational programs, the Together We Can program, social programs, educational programs involving communities and police re-engineering. And in Medellin, it was a different national scheme. They create a national police, reform the national police to a new program with the, to reform justice. Palermo was different. The model was more focused on the prosecutors in Palermo. What they did was to empower the judges, give them more power. They were even anonymous judges so that they could could not be detected. This gave them a lot of strength and they were able to bring to justice the criminal mafias. In Palermo, the program was with prosecutors more than with the police. This graph, what it wants to show is that how in all cases, when the cities and governors work on this, here how the violence grows, it grows in all cases, a group for five to six years, and then after these programs are implemented, once they have been implemented, the violence begins to decline in a different way. The most efficient was New York. It was the one that declined the quickest and the slowest was Medellin. But in all cases, you can see the curve, how the violence declined after the programs were implemented. Here, this was, we generated a model where we identified the most important stages in these processes. In this model, you can see some important points. First, the first point, there is, uh, we identify the criminal evolution, high impact violence, extortion, homicide, kidnapping. When we see this, authority reacts and create different types of programs all relate with different uh, focuses. But here we see how there is a resistance of the criminal activity. They don't want to lose ground. They don't want to lose control of their criminal operations. 
La autoridad sigue generando esas capacidades hasta que... And this continues until there's a breaking point, which is important. Hasta que el Estado es superior en capacidad de operación is a superior in operating capacity and in territorial coverage. This is the breaking point. When the state has this capacity, here the trajectory changes. In all cases, this breaking point is identified. This varies according to the cities. New York was the shortest. Medellin was, took the longest. After that, Mantener un esquema There, permanente de we can de keep a muy permanent rule of law, Entrar, combate las and causas after that, the important thing is to combat the causes uh, of crime salud, with social prog programs such as education, plazo. health, and that will es keep this trend in the long run. This is what has happened in the world. I want to show you, I want you to, com to compare, remember this was the Mexican one, here we've got 2008, uh, violence escalates, here we reach the breaking point, when the state reaches the point that it has a superior capacity, more force, greater coverage, and then it begins to decline, the same as the other graph. And now it's the question that you will all be asking, so, well, what happened? This is 2014. Public policy is defined by a secretariat that was in charge of that. And there they removed this. Uh, this program was called Plataforma Mexico, and many of those programs were no longer implemented. That secretariat is closed down, there's less budget, and so this f uh, fight against crime is lowered, and so this leads to the creation of self-defenses. This generates this new phenomenon, which we know today, the increase. And so today, Mexico is on that path again, the same process. After this diagnostic, what happens? So, where do we go? As you know, as Tony explained, there has been an election in Mexico last year, and we've got a new president, Andrés Manuel López Obrador. And I want to point out something important. This election, in terms of voting, has an important president. President. In Mexico, for more than 30 years, a president had not won with more than 50%. This current president won with 53.19%, more than half the votes out there. This is the first time in 30 years that a president has been so legitimized by the social vote. And why? Security is a very important matter. If you can see the proportion that prior presidents had, Cedillo won with 48%, Fox Quesada only 42%, Calderón 35%. Uh, I was minister at that time, and it was very complex, because if without that legitimacy, without that backing in the political sphere, to combat secure in, uh, crime is more difficult. Peña, only 38% votes. Having said this, as far as security, something that is important, the most important thing is security as a concept is that by no society authority. The, in this sense, prompt crime detection is the basis for combating crime, and this must be done by society. 
So the great challenge is to articulate the, uh, the capacity that states or governments have to bring into line this early detection, prompt detection of crime generated by society with the capacity of the government. When this doesn't work, this binome doesn't work in a fight against crime, criminals take advantage of this. They will get in the middle and break that articulation. And that is why the importance of the legitimacy in the voting, because if a president has legitimacy, this will give him a margin to apply strong security policies as far as security. If, if he is backed and can carry out this prompt crime detection, the result would be much, much better. Here we can see the different elements for this concept. Historically, we have seen a reactive model in the past, when there was military personnel in a place, that would inhibit criminals. Nowadays, they would shoot at uh, military personnel. That concept no longer is enough to deter crime. Now we have to create new precepts, and there's a new thesis, a new model, based this defines four minimum stages in planning, information gathering, analysis, and implementation. Those stages generate a process which is an intelligence spiral. If you constantly go through these four stages to generate information, analyze it, implement it, then this isn't a cycle. This is a spiral which and I systematically go up. If this is this way, a system obliges me to increase in knowledge towards my objective. That's why we need solid institutions. Part of my presentation is based on these precepts. Using the tools, here is the fire. We need for this fire we need three components: oxygen, fuel, and heat, and something important for this to interact. These we need fuel, heat, oxygen. After 25 years, I've seen this all over the world, and I've been the security ministry. I've been in security for many years. I've worked abroad. I've worked in intelligence for many years. I wrote a thesis to explain why did this happen at Mexico, and not only in Mexico, all over Latin America, and also in parts of Asia. But why in the case of Mexico? Fire requires three things, fuel, oxidants, and a spark to set it off. For this violence to exist, we need three components. Illicit, illegal, illicit markets, criminal logistics, and institutional weakness. And they have to interact. If I remove one of those components, as if this were fire, if, if I take one away, it will not exist. What extinguishes, what is a fire extinguisher? When I put out a fire, what happens? When we uh, direct this, this takes the place of oxygen. And so if we have fuel, oxygen, and the flame, but if I remove one of those components, the fire will uh, go out, or at least. So what can I do to reduce the phenomenon of violence? Illicit markets, criminal 
um, organization and institutional weakness. This is supports the criminal activities we have today in Mexico. In the long term, but we have to identify the causes of crime, and they are identified in the sectors of education, health, economy, and social development. This takes it into the long term. Now I will show you this index. We are going to show you uh, this is the GLAC index. This is a tool we have which allows us to calculate for the whole world. I can, this is calculated for Mexico. This index, it goes from 6 to minus 6. It has algorithms that calculate these magnitudes, and it has a scale. It, from 6 to minus 6, but in practical terms, if I remove the theoretical part, it goes from 2 to minus 2, because there is no entity that is completely good or completely bad. So usually we go from plus 2 to minus t. Now you can see in general terms which is the magnitude each area of the country with the index with its color. And I can see over time, I can go back two years to compare how this phenomenon behaves. Afterwards, if I want to see what is the ranking for the country for the national behavior, I can go back to this graph. This is corrected on a daily basis, and it's closed every week. I can see the magnitude each one of these within the GLAC index. The important thing here is that I can separate indicators and variables in a transactional way. If I take political social variables, I can see which is the one, I can see in the ranking which is the behavior of those variables. For example, if I take security and justice, which is the entity has the best circumstance of those variables, and I can identify which has the best position for those variables. But something, there's one more thing that is more important. Here I can see, going back to the idea of fire, if I want to, want to measure violence and criminal activity, illicit markets, delictive, uh, criminal logistics, institutional decline, I can measure with this radial. The center, the outer is the best. One hundred, the red line is the national uh, average. The, you can see how the national average uh, uh, works when we look at uh, illicit markets and uh, criminal logistics. I can, com I can compare. I can do it at a national, do this at a, see it at a national level or at an international level. I can compare with Bogota, um, Washington, or to see which, where's the strength or the weaknesses, where to direct our efforts to lower a variable. Maybe I can't remove one component of the variable. But maybe I can have an effect on the illicit markets or on the criminal logistics. This is for the part of components. This is for the crimes. This would be the indirect impact, economic, how each variable impacts on security, education, investment, etc. These, here I can see a cube, political social variables, uh, so justice, if I, here I can see the economic and financial aspects. 
en amarillo es político social y yellow es social political blue es es entidad de the green security and justice this tells me how important each sector is where is the strength in each one of these areas and the weaknesses. And here, in the case of components, to identify illicit uh, markets, criminal logistics, I can see which entity has the best circumstance in each of these three variables. And the same for the criminal and violence aspect. And what is the most important part of all this? Here we have 1,320 indicators, 1,620 indicators. Each line is an indicator. Yellow are social, political, blue, security and justice. And the red, I'm going to take one example. The energy, the one that is in fashion in Mexico, as you know, Mexico, here the uh, theft of fuel it has been growing. Uh, when I was in the United States, I was able to see with a company in Houston, they are investing in the possibility of participating in uh, oil pipelines to Mexico, but they want people to look after these um, pipelines because there are people who are stealing oil. So they took me along to explain uh, to them about that. They can't go to Mexico armed, that is illegal. But in the second place, imagine uh, what, uh, how do we deploy uh, troops to uh, look after pipelines? It's unthinkable. Unthinkable. Imagine, we talked of three components, illicit markets, um, criminal logistics, and um, institutional weakness. In Supposing they already perforated the pipeline, they've removed the fuel, they've got it in um, barrels, then they have to transport them. That would be the um, criminal logistics. Supposing they're stealing uh, oil from lorries, if I take that variable and I choose it within this system, of here on the left, on the left I can see in the year 2000, I want to see the behavior throughout time, what happened from 2000 to date. This data is nearly 20 years old. It begins in the year 2000. On the left, I don't know if you can see it. No, I think you can't see it. This is theft of uh, oil. This data then is practically encompasses 20 years. Here there is a correlation factor of 0 0.74, 0.72. What does this mean for those of you who are economists? There's a good correlation, 0 0.4.3, which is 30 or 40 percent of the correlation. And they point out that there is efficiency of correlation. There it's 0 0.7 of every three trucks that have been robbed. Two are related to uh, theft of oil. If I can see which of the entities that are participating in this theft, here you can see where we have the greatest amount of theft of oil. Yes, it coincides. Where we have the most amount of theft is where we have the greatest amount of theft of oil. Where trucks 
where trucks have been es que más fácil combatir o cuidar los Puebla and Hidalgo would be this area. Combatir el robo de camiones robados. So what is easier? La referencia es que hoy, si usted sale a la universidad, va a encontrar patines y bicicletas que traen un transporte digital. You came today. You saw that they were into the university. You could see skates. Un transporte digital para ver la posición de 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 un patín o de una bicicleta. Para ponerse un camión de carga sería so, for example, here you have uh, skateboards or Entonces, bicycles with a satellite, uh, uh, satellite key that you can use, and uh, it would be easier to try to fight these, the stolen trucks rather than the oil. Because if we take that away, then how will they be able to move these millions of barrels of oil that were stolen? They can't. So it's like the extinguisher, like I said earlier. If you stop the oxygen, there's no more fire. And this is the same here. This is to identify where do you best dedicate your efforts to. What are the components that I can access so that I can cut the oxygen from this problem. And this is a tool that is very useful. And this is data that's been in existence for 20 years, almost 18 years. And these are indicators that are useful at an international level from uh, the World Bank uh, and from other international organizations analyzed at a state and uh, national level to calculate the impact for each indicator and the factor that it has, what impact it has to, on the society to be able to focus on security. I think that I'm on time. My time is good, so thank you. But anyway, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Enaro. Uh, uh, let me. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sure that a, a lot of the, the get our guests tonight want to know uh, what uh, what's coming up as well, and uh, uh, what to expect under the Lopez Obrador administration. Uh, so I have a couple of questions for you, uh, and um, one of them is. Um, uh, President Lopez Obrador has proposed the creation of a National Guard. Uh, this mix of uh, police force taken out of the military, a lot of soldiers that are going to be converted into this National Guard, which is going to function as a police force. But at the same time, it's going to not be placed in the Ministry for Public Safety and Security, but it's going to be under military command. Uh, what do you think about this uh, scheme, this particular structure? What, what, do you think it'll work? Do you think it's something that, that is different, innovative, and that can actually solve uh, the issue of organized crime or general crime and violence in Mexico? Bueno, primero, ya explicaba yo que well, first, this government has a huge legitimacy due to the voting, uh, the percentage of people who voted. But to answer your question from a technical standpoint, the experience, not only Mexico, but at a worldwide uh, level, this has been used. And it was used in Latin America and in Mexico. It was used in the 70s and the 80s. And even when I was a minister of security, Security, a part of my process was to have that model with the National Guard, with the military. But the history with respect to security in the world, all countries had the armed forces for security. But then they all realized that this was very difficult to have armed forces interacting with the society at large because their training, their doctrine, their training does not go 
hand in hand with a police training is different than the Air Force. And in Europe specifically, they started this transition where they created the National Guard with a different model. Now, this doesn't mean that there may not be armed forces in the police force, but it's a different framework from a technical standpoint. And there's a difference in the type of weapons, the type of logistics and operations on the street, their movement and their operations. It's completely different. But what's important here, Tony, is that the experience worldwide, not just in Mexico, it happened in Spain, in France, everywhere. It, it happened in Mexico as well, is that first, it's a great... Uh, it, it's really an issue for the armed forces. It creates this uh, deterioration in the armed forces. And it has been proven historically, not only in Mexico, but throughout the world, but this deterioration, when they interact with society, with a community, as in the public, it's a negative, uh, always a negative impact, because using force is is done for, is for something else. And if you look at the weapons that the armed forces use compared to the police, that's enough for you to see that a soldier has a maybe 72 it's like this big the the, the bullet I want to see if somebody stealing in a market uh, uh, you know groceries you you can't shoot at them with this size bullet right so from a technical standpoint it's different so yes I insist also in Mexico Mexico and all over the world like I said it starts the process it's you used for that. In Mexico, during the 70s, 80s, 90s, we did that. But the challenge is, how do you transition into creating capacity in the police force so that they can have this interaction, this social interaction? And that's why it's important, the most important, what I said earlier, is to detect early the crime articulated with society. If you don't have this articulation, this, this uh, two-way street, you can't beat it. And because when you detect it, the intelligence, the key is the society. If that's not articulated properly with authority, then you cannot respond to it. In the U.S., for example, you see it with the FBI, and there's some people that I'm, I'm happy to see here from the FBI. The FBI has a great capacity of detecting fugitives, and that helps society. Many of them it's due to the positive impact that the FBI has with the people. People will call them in when they find a fugitive. That's because they have a good relation. That's because they have a good interaction with the community. And that, throughout the world, same thing. So in terms of specifically technical terms, I think for Mexico, this exercise was done in the 70s, was done in the 80s, was done in the 90s. The evolution in the 90s was that from the federal police, they had this evolution of going to a military force to turn them into a police force and then incorporate some people that have different different training. We need a lot of systems now, a lot of information. Now you can't just cover a certain area, a massive coverage, and that's enough. Before, the presence of a police officer was enough. Now it doesn't work. That's not enough. It doesn't deter crime. They even shoot back at them. And that has changed. That's why I'm saying this phenomenon is different. So you have to, you, you can add, but in the long term, term, this creates a deterioration in the interaction with the community, and this doesn't work. And this is also deterioration for the, force, the, the armed forces as well. And so, in general, this has to evolve. And from what I have seen and my experience was exactly to try to move from this evolution of the military service and to a civil service. And throughout the world, all the democratic countries, there isn't one where the police is in charge, the, the people in charge are the armed forces. It, it just doesn't, it doesn't work that way. 
El, 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 el sistema de la guardia. No, a ver, el, el, la, la, la perspectiva. No conozco a detalle cuál es el planteamiento. Um, I don't know exactly what they're guardia. trying to no, plan with a national guard. I, I don't know, but what I've seen with respect of the media and people that have shared this with me to involve the armed forces, I do not share this thought. I was in charge of managing this to have armed forces working with police. And I will say just in a practical sense, just today, let's say the model works in the day-to-day -day operation and a military police, per, for example, with a huge weapon, sees somebody trying to pickpocket someone on a bus, for example, today. That military police would have to grab that theft and take them to the Ministry of Public um, of, of the interior, and that legal process, just that, implies that the military police has to be involved in a scheme where he's not trained to do that or is not involved in that process at all. And also, you're taking them away from the operational logistics, which is where they're trained to be able, because that's what they have to do in order to arrest this, uh, this specific uh, thief, for example. So then they're going to move into a civil department. And then that means that you have to create a civil public force, which is a different process. So in all cases, to use armed forces in security is the first step. In Mexico, I think this has evolved. It was done in the 80s, in the 70s, in the 90s, like I said. And I think you have to train police officers with a different background now. And in Mexico, I think that's the challenge now. When I got there in Mexico in uh, 2006, to the secretariat, I had a military brigade that I had to receive, 6,000 of them from the military police that worked for the federal police. And when I delivered, I delivered 37,000 federal police. And they are all civil, and some of them were military that were retired, and they incorporated into the civil service regime to participate as police. But there were some young men that were engineers for cybersecurity, for operational, and even psychologists, for kidnapping, sociologists, to treat some other, other criminals, lawyers, all of the technical education so that they can reach to the entire spectrum of security. You can't just have an operative force if you don't have the analysis so that you can reach to where you need to reach. So that's why I don't know the entire scheme, but from what I've seen from the technical aspect, it needs components that need to be added because that's not enough. There's other components that have to be involved. I read recently that they will recover La Patora, Mexico, and that was a system where at the national level we, they were articulating all the criminal activity and communication throughout the country. For the U.S., maybe that's normal, but for us it's not. So in order to share data from a license plate from somewhere, everybody has state information from state to state. So they have to share it at a joint level. And that, that they used to do it with, it was shared for, with all the states, and they could look at it, or criminal, any background checks, etc. And all that, that's a basis in order to be able to fight crime. If that doesn't work, that's like being out in the sea without a compass. You may 
may be very powerful, but if you don't know where you're going, then you can't get anywhere. So that's why, on that perspective, you need certain capabilities and skills. And I think they're going to redo, because the last government, they just took that out. And now they took it to Congress, and they have recreated the secretariat. And I think that's very valuable. And I'm in, I'm in, in favor of that, to recreate the secretariat. It's important. It, it's in, it's in, incredible to think that it, it just fell apart and they they decided to take it away. But I do not agree with the fact that the public security has not does not have to be in charge of the armed forces because from a difference, like I said, for me there's a, a huge deterioration and it doesn't work to have the armed forces. And at the end of the day, they have to be civil people working. When you go to a trial, for example, then the evolution is going to end up into a civil process. So you have to go to the beginning to find out how you evolve to have this police force that is ready for that. And Mexico has an important number of young people that could be trained to do that. For example, in the U.S., to go to the FBI, you have to have a master's or a PhD. In Europe, it's the same thing. Well, in Mexico, it should be you have to have some sort of university degree. So it's people trained, and then they can be trained to cybersecurity, operational intelligence, risk management, kidnapping, etc. People that are trained for that. And there is an offer of young people people that can be incorporated that I believe in that. That's what I believe in. Mexico has that capacity to do that. And I think that is the model that would be more interesting. And I think that obviously there's a lot of work to be done, but that's what I think. Let me ask you a question that I think is very important, and that is the, the structure. I mean, you spent many years, and you spent certainly uh, uh, six years under the Calderon administration structuring the public safety and security apparatus in Mexico, intelligence, Plataforma Mexico and others, the federal police, and the Ministry for Public Safety and Security, the SSP. So you spent a lot of time articulating that. Uh, obviously, there were some issues in articulating the, the, the security strategy with the governors and the mayors. So the, the three, the federal the three levels of government were difficult. Mr. Lopez Obrador is proposing a new uh, Secretariat of Public Safety and Security, and the intelligence agency will be in it. The federal police will be under the military, and then you got the PGR, which is the Attorney General's office, and then you got human rights in the Interior Ministry, Gobernación. How, what do you see here in this new restructuring? What, what's, what's off with this? Uh, uh, structure that they're proposing to deal with public safety and security. You think it'll work? Firstly, I don't know in detail this proposal, just what's public is what I know, but it is very different. National security is different from public safety. They're two different things. So with the SSN, with, it has to do with national security. In many countries, there are institutions that are related to that, and they have completely different tasks than public safety. There may be some overlap, and there may be some joint tasks, but they are different theses and different concepts in their initial conception. They're different roads, different, completely different tracks. And that is throughout the world, not just in Mexico. You go and you see there's some that are tied with public safety and some with national security. They're not collapsed. They're not the same. So I think that there should be two different institutions. I think that's a good idea for an institutional model. I think that's important. That has to be done to be able to govern. And I don't know, and I don't know the detail of how the SSN will end up, because I don't think that it's been completely 
thought out yet, but maybe it may change name, but there will be an entity in charge of national security. The government needs it, the state needs it. I don't know what it's going to be called, but on the other hand, it's again throughout the world this happens. There isn't one democrat nation that has the responsibility of public safety in the hands of the armed forces. Additionally, it's such a delicate issue in the 70s, it was such a delicate issue that at that time they legislated to exactly forbid the use of armed forces in the police because they realized the wear and tear, the deterioration this meant for the armed forces and for the community because this interaction over time generates a deterioration for both parties. This has been proven throughout the world. That's why the laws were passed to forbid this so that the armed forces do not participate from the civil society, not only in Mexico, throughout the world. And that's why, at the end of the day, in all the processes, they've used this in the beginning, but then they use the civil the civil society, because that's the model that works. And this institutional definition, I don't know exactly how they're going to do it. Like I said, all I know is what's public. I don't know the details. And, uh, but at the end of the day, for the day-to-day -day management of public safety, it's very detailed, it's specific, it requires a lot of attention, and there's completely different from the armed forces. So that's why you need something specific for national security and something specific for public safety. Because in the law, this is going to be defined, but how does the SSN end up, how does the Secretariat end up working, what they're going to do? Because today, to make this, for example, to bring a criminal in front of a judge, you have to sign. It has to be a police officer that signs. If there's a military police there, they have to sign that, and then they have to come and appear in the trial, for example, and this will change the whole institution. Final question from me before I open it to the rest of the audience here. Um, so when you look at the uh, administration, the Lopez Obrador administration, the whole landscape, um, you mentioned that one of the most important assets uh, that they have is their political capital, the political capital that comes from 53% of the national vote. Okay. Uh, they must have, or you must have thought about various strengths and weaknesses that they have. Just taking a quick look, a bird's eye view, so to speak, of the administration. What are the strengths that you see that they have to tackle this problem? And what are the weaknesses that you see that they have? <laughs> <laughs> A ver, bueno, sin duda, la, la parte más valiosa, ya lo comentaba, es, es la legitimidad. Eso, eso es the strongest point is their legitimacy. That is something eh, very valuable. The possibility the dislegitimacy eh, gives de them with... Mexico hasn't had the win. A president has won like this for more than 30 years. Congress... Vamos, tenga más, más representación con su partido. They haven't had a Entonces, Congress decir, eso, with eso, so much representation of their own party. In, este, the, this has not existed for 30 years in Mexico. This will give them an incredible scope, even at muy, the muy level valioso. of um, lugar, making laws. Security, public safety is a very important point, 
and uh, with this backing, this is very, very important. When society is active, participates voting, that inertia of voting, if it's related to uh, prompt detection of crime, and if that is dealt with, um, that will stop crime right for, at the root. So I consider this one of the great strengths. But, with, but conceptually speaking, porque no, no, no son públicos y, y la gente que me ha tocado comentarlos y, y analizarlos no todavía no está definido. No todavía 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 está to make the armed forces into policing forces, that will lead to deterioration. And that happens all over the world, not only in Mexico. That happened in Spain, in France. It has happened in Mexico, in Latin America, in Chile, in Argentina. All over the world this has happened. This has already been proven. And all countries, Mexico, um, also, we have used armed forces to transition to a, a civil, uh, civic model. The, but this can be a weak point. I've already lived through this. I understand the urgency of this problem. I've already lived through this situation. But I think the trend has to be the focus on the civilian aspect in public safety. Mexico has universities that have a great um, supply of uh, graduates. And if these young people that are trained, if can join the public safety effort, the impact will be much greater. If I want to address the criminality today, I think what is important, an important way is to do this in, um, in a way in offices. It's not only deploying forces at a territorial, but we also need to do a lot of work in our offices. We need people which are highly trained. And Mexico has got trained people. I think that would be the right approach. Another complex matter is that the Mexican state must pay the operative cost that uh, public safety of the country needs. Otherwise, somebody else will pay for it. Call it corruption, call it um, the criminals, whatever. Because that cart morphs and somebody puts gas in it. So either the state does this, so it will control the way the cart morphs, or somebody else will do it. So I think they should uh, be careful of this. Great. Uh, let's uh, pick up a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, George and then uh, uh, O'Malley. Yeah. I wonder if uh, either of the speakers uh, could uh, comment on the possible use of the mobile internet, the mobile internet to monitor vehicles or to mo monitor people, and also the use of artificial intelligence in some way as a security measure. And also I'm thinking um, that the mobile internet in, with the use of... Um, smartphones that could be distributed to populations with um, high incidence of criminal behavior like in gasoline, the huachicoleros, that it could have an economic multiplier effect opening up people to, to um, the data resources of the internet. Here, and then we'll go to... Uh, okay.
No, sin duda, sin duda. Yo yes, well, no eh, doubt. Yes, absolutely. I share your perspective. That's amplia. why I think we should have a broad uh, eh, way of looking at this. Justo es una que uh, and no solo esto en el mundo. Uh, Uh, not all over the world today, the example we mentioned about the theft of trucks. If we had a satellite transponder on each of those trucks, that would be the end of theft. And nowadays, the satellite transponders, uh, kids' skates have them. I've seen how kids throw their skates and then they have their uh, the application on their phone, what does the transponder, what does that transponder cost? If we use this, if we put them on the trucks, that would be the end of the theft of trucks. I think that safety is related to many components. We have to see in which component needs more uh, technology. What you say is key. This is related to communications, the use of internet, and other resources we have. We, if we use, made use of everything, we could reduce criminal activity, transponders, prompt detection, reports, citizen reports. Um, for example, today social networks also play an important role in the early detection of criminal activity. If we look at the amount of reports that come from society that don't reach the DA's office or the prosecutor's office, uh, but they're there on the internet, we have gone through certain exercises to see this. We can identify a lot just by, if we look at the communications which are reporting crimes, even before they reach the DA's office, we can see a lot. This is important, as you say, and I do, I share your thought. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary. In your opening remarks, you mentioned the big reduction in, in murders in, in Medellin. Uh, it wasn't entirely a result of it, but Plan Colombia was part of the, what led to the turnaround in Colombia. Um, obviously, they faced massive rates of narco violence and also a civil war. Um, and that Plan Colombia allowed for massive degree of American involvement, billions of dollars put towards eradication of, of, of poppies, of, of drugs, retraining of, of both the military and the police, exchanges of intelligence services, training of special forces. Um, in Mexico, if things got bad enough, would that ever be a possibility? Or is the political legacy of American interference and, and invasion of Mexico, the you know, U.S.-Mexican War in the 1840s and 50s, and say after the you know, Mexican uh, independence, is that too, too far a bridge to cross? Would that be something Mexico would ever consider? And, and if a president wants to do it, would they lose their basically the next election? Well, I mean, I don't know it's only one term, but would it be impossible? <coughs> Yes, that's important. Thank you for the question. Tom knows a lot about this because he was involved in this. He knows much about it. First, I was for 25 years in the uh, security area, and I know the case of Colombia very well. As far as Mexico, I we have had a lot of communication with your colleagues of the United States in all those agencies that are open, FBI, DEA, or whatever. We have a, a, had a great, great cooperation in key areas which have allowed us to combat crime in important areas. My experience, in my experience, the most important part as far as combating crime is intelligence. I think that is extremely important in terms of interaction, uh, the possibilities of integration. 
As far as Mexico, my experience is that it, this is, is like the, the pipelines, the Pemex pipeline. If they want to stop the theft of oil with forces in, uh, all over the territory, Colleagues were telling me of uh, ex-military forces were used to combat this. No, this is unthinkable. There's no way that you can have people deployed to take care of the pipelines. It's unthinkable. It's absurd. It's absurd. The problem isn't in the forces, the amount of forces, because if you say the bad ones are over no, there, okay, we can get there. No, all the concepts we have to, how do we generate public safety? We have to train the police adequately and train them, prepare them, educate them. When I was in charge of the police force, for example, they were all certified like the FBI. They had to be trained by the FBI. So we needed people that, I want people that are technically trained like the FBI, then the DEA and those agencies. So I think that the important part is to share intelligence, training, and and to share privileged information. But in my experience, that how do we build integral capacities in public safety? We can gain, how do we, how do we build a market? How do we build a football stadium or a school? Or in Ciudad Juarez, for example, we combated them straight on for many years, but we lowered crime after we had done uh, so implemented social programs. So the challenge is first to have the capacity to identify where are specific components to address the variable that we think is the most important. And second, to identify the components necessary to have the logistics to do that. And the United States, in my 25 years experience, has been a great ally, great ally. The United States, in my experience, during my time in charge of the national security, police, the United States has been a great ally in training, certifying, um, building trust, etc. They have always been a great, great ally. There is an enormous potential there, which I think we should tap into and increase. As far as the forces, increasing forces, no, that I do not agree with. That's not the right approach. But Colombia's case was very different. There, they needed the forces for the harvest, for the crofts. They needed to, they needed the helicopters. Um, that was a different case. They're totally different cases. There, the concepts in Colombia in the 90s, but Colombia nowadays is having problems again related to those processes because in the long run, if we want this to last in the long run, we have to go to the causes of the crime. If we solve that, there will be no long term. So we have to look at the components of the causes that lead to those crimes for this to last in the long run. Okay, we're going to close, but I'll take one more question here, and then uh, I think it's uh, it's about time. Yeah. Could you please uh, tell us approximately what uh, percentage of the Mexican crime 
is uh, related directly or indirectly to U.S. drug consumption, and what, uh, how will AMLO uh, address that factor? Well, un porcentaje específico. Specifically, I can give you some ideas of when I was in charge, but when I was in charge, things have changed quite a lot, quite a lot. Something important in the current situation of Mexico, I mentioned this a minute ago and I repeat it. When we talk about drugs, for example, there was a debate about marijuana, where there was a public debate on that. The initial argument years back was that if this was legalized, this would reduce violence. Then that was the initial debate, but then it was migrated to the fact that this was related to health. Why do I say this? Because as far as security, the drugs, the issue of drugs is part of the illicit markets when this is more profitable than something else, this is like a magnet, like any entrepreneur or businessman. They are always looking for the greatest profitability, and that is where they will go. So do the criminals. They are looking, seeking for the market that is most profitable. In, Mar in Mexico, for example, the evolution of uh, uh, drug trafficking. I was involved in the 60s, 70s. At that time in Mexico, there was contraband smuggling. Before there was smuggling, um, there was a restrictive policy in economic. Uh, people uh, we used to take to Mexico, we would take clothes, the general contraband smuggled goods in general, clothes, um, television sets or whatever. And that wasn't considered a crime. That was more more or less accepted. But that kind of smuggling created um, criminal logistics that created routes from north to south, which were taken up later on by drug traffickers from south to north. Those who started drug trafficking had previously been smugglers. They moved to the more profitable illegal market. In, in Mexico, time, some time back, there was a traffic of immigrants that was so profitable. There was people smuggling. They were important structures. Human trafficking was important before. But now it's oil. This has been so profitable that when you talk about what is the proportion of the importance of drugs nowadays, criminal activity in Mexico in the past was related to drugs. So drugs, that was a historical perspective, but that's no longer that way. Nowadays, criminal activity is taking part in local crimes. This is part of the violence that has grown in Mexico because they are related to organized crime, such as extortion, kidnapping, this began to, has begun to impact society, and that proportion has changed. Before we said, no, they're criminals, then um, drug traffickers, but this doesn't affect us. But that is not the same today. Nowadays, the um, stealing of oil is related to people who are in drug trafficking because it all depends where is the most profitable market, and that is where the criminals would go. If I, if I legalize marijuana, will the criminal structures disappear? No, they'll move to the next illegal market. Hmm? 
otherwise they would dissolve or fall apart. So the proportion in the past was one like you mentioned, it was related to drug trafficking, but nowadays it's no longer that way. Now it's related to extortion, homicide, kidnapping, related to the local criminals. Before they would steal, people wouldn't attack you in the street with a... Uh, with a powerful weapon. Nowadays, they will use an AK-45 on you well, just to steal you your much. phone. Uh, please uh, help me thank our guest. Uh, thank for Gracias. Gracias. Thank you very much, everyone. Good night. Okay. Thank you.